Welcome to the Film Funnel. This is episode number nine, and the movie we will be looking at this episode is 1967's Playtime. My name is Susan Tekla Kriglin Scott. I have a co host who's going to say something just a touch witty right now about himself. Introduce yourself. Ah, see, I. Mwah. I, I, I bon think I, I shot myself in the foot there. That's kind of French, le bon mot, isn't it? It's kind of it's a, extremely French. That's appropriate because we're we're doing French uh, today. I've taken French, and you will hear how badly that went during the course of this episode. Yeah, I feel like you've taken it where it shouldn't have gone. I'm Joe Dater, cartoonist, author, and New York City's fastest carriage horse driver. So we uh, were doing a Canadian movie last time, and I'm so thrilled that we're now in real France. Real France. No offense, French Canada. French Canada. I mean, come on, what's that? That's like French fries. Come on. What's French about French Canada? It's, it's about French, as French as French toast. Come on. But we didn't come here to trash Canada. Um, no. Never, never. We are here to talk about Jacques Tati. Jacques Tati. I think we're classing up the joint by covering this movie. That's what I think. You've known me a long time. I've never worn a hat. I've never seen you in a hat. I've never been a hat person. I've always felt my hair is my hat. To that end, I have far, far less hat than I used to have. So I've thought, you know, now that I'm older, I should start wearing a hat. And so in, uh, I was kind of inspired by Jacques Tati. I, I got myself a, I got myself a Jacques Tati hat. Nice. To put on and try to, try that nice, on for nice. size. Nice, nice. I like it. See the, uh, the look there. It's so joli. Doesn't overwhelm my head and it uh, makes me look... I think I think it makes me look like a, like a Frenchman, but wait for the full effect. There we go. Ah, le peep. Of course. Oh, oh, c'est c'est si n'est pas un peep. There's this, there's a scene in the movie where Tati is giving someone directions and he's pointing on the map with the pipe, and I think yeah. I saw that and I said, I think I could do that. I I yes. could I could very easily do that. That's gonna become a thing. I was gonna dress up as a woman attending the Royal Gardens restaurant with a black a pretty black shirt and pearls and the whole thing but and it just didn't feel tati enough for me mm, so yeah. i'm instead what i was going for here is attendee of the garden party in mononc which we'll get to um there was a woman in sort of a jumpsuit it's also a little bit traffic i look a little bit like a garage repairman at the same time it kind of works for in both movies so that's what i was going for i don't know i don't know not very good at this as you know we're talking about jacques tati now say you never heard of tati you never heard of playtime joe how would you explain this to someone uh let me describe uh the plot of uh of playtime Moving right along, let me now describe the characters. <laughs> um, yeah, that was pretty uh, accurate. You know, yeah, I think that was it. There's no, there's no apparent plot whatsoever. Uh, this movie defies any of the rules of conventional movie making or storytelling. It does not have a protagonist. It does not have any any semblance of a story. It's a movie you you climb into and spend two hours inside of, and then you leave. Yes. That's about it. Now, yeah. when I say Francois Truffaut, he was another French guy. No, yet another French guy. And uh, also maker of films, you may know. So I hear. And uh, what he said about this film is, he, he described this film as, it's a film from another planet, one where movies are made differently. And um, I think that's a pretty accurate, this, this is really its own animal. Like, there's really nothing else like it. And it's kind of interesting what led up to it. Francois Truffaut um, some, actually had a lot to do with how this movie ended up, I would say. We'll get into that. So what we're going to do this episode is we're going to talk about playtime and then we're going to take a break and talk about the life of Jacques Tati, uh, his life and his other films. And his hat. We're going to talk about his hat. And his hat. And then we're going to talk about the film again, and, as we usually do. And of course, there's chapter headings in the description box if you want to skip. We won't be offended. You could do that. You could jump up and down and back and forth and watch us any which way. If you want to skip and skip around, that's fine. You people skip one second of my commentary <laughs> and I will hunt you down and kill you. You can, you can skip mine. You can just, just jump over to all of Joe's stuff. Um, okay, so Playtime, 1967. This is a real art film. This is a real auteur film. What you'd consider an auteur film. This is, in a way, for some people, very hard to watch because it's it's so much of an arty film. Yeah. It takes 200, 300 years from now. Someone said, name one movie that encapsulates modernism. 
Um, you'd probably say Metropolis. <laughs> but the next movie, if it wasn't Metropolis, it might be Playtime. And what's interesting is they're so far apart in years. Metropolis, one of the first, you know, earliest films in Playtime would be way at the end of modernism. But this is, you know, pretty dead center modernism. I want to talk a little bit about that. The thing that I don't see mentioned much, and I think it's really, it's, I think it's very, very significant about Tati's intentions with this movie or what he was or may have been attempting to say is that the name of the movie is not work time. Even though so, like the first half of it takes place in these office buildings and there's business going on and he's trying to have an appointment and it's all about this sort of like bureaucracy of uh, of offices and uh, getting to see the person he wants to see, but he has to go through this maze of cubicles and there's all these people on the phone doing these generic numbers and everything. And it seems like it's about business in the city. And yet the movie's called Playtime. It's called Playtime. And I think that's very significant. And it, it, it goes from that to almost a full hour of just exuberant play and joy. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And that's why it's a, that's why it's a comedy. And that's why it's ultimately a, an incredibly positive, hopeful movie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the original name for it was Recreation, by the way, Recreation or something like that. But yeah, and of course it follows those first two major movies, Jour de la Fête, The Day of the Festival, and Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. I mean, these are just like, we, you know, like, let's have some good, you know, it's all the R's, having a good time. So it's sort of interesting yeah. that he continues that theme, but flips it so completely, just flips it so completely. Um, this was a 447-page script, and, um, you know, if you see a Tati script, it's not a lot of dialogue, it's a lot of description. It's kind of interesting yeah. to read, you know, how he wrote those things up. Very sparse dialogue, but the movie is filled with squeaking and clacking shoes. that are front and center. The clacking shoes yeah. are front and center. Um, chairs that make noises when you sit in them. <sighs> the buzzing of the lights, you literally hear the buzzing of the lights as front and center. It's hard to imagine, but you know, again, if you're gonna watch this movie, um, either watch it with very good speakers or with headphones on because this is oh, all very important. He labored over exactly how to make the sounds he wanted to make. Almost oh, nothing. Imagine. You'll, you'll notice this. Almost nothing you see on the screen was recorded. It's all post-production. Yeah, I, and you can I tell. sense that. You can tell. All of the sound and all of the dialogue is put in later. Yeah, I would think that. And there's such a, there's such a tapestry of sounds. Um, sound effects, dialogue, and music all weaved in this amazingly glorious, beautiful way. It's such a work of art. And I could imagine it would have taken at least as long to do the sound editing on this as it would be to film it. The star of this movie is the environment. It's the right. city. It's this little tiny corner of a city that's supposed to be Paris, but it's not. It is a completely constructed environment that Tati made himself. It's called Tativille. Um, yeah. and, I, I and could so not believe that the first time I saw the film. I just yeah. could not wrap my head around it. There are shots yeah. in that where you think, that I can't believe it's a set. It's it's all a set. Every yeah. single bit of it. There's like maybe two scenes that were shot at Orly Airport, but otherwise it's all a set, completely constructed by Tati, designed by Eugene Roman. They're not really seeing Paris. When you're in this version of Paris, the only time you see any real Paris is in the reflections of these glass doors, someone opening yeah. a glass door, you'll catch a reflection of the Eiffel Tower as if it is right there. But you never see, you just see a reflection of it. You see a reflection of the Arc de Triomphe. Everything in this movie is like a slate gray. It's like this brushed stainless steel. And, the, and every place looks like that. So the airport and the nightclub and the office building all look exactly the same. Right, right, right. They all have that exact same sort of uh, brushed steel. And I found out that that wasn't real that those walls that were in that sort of l like brushed stainless steel, those were photographs of brushed stainless steel that they took and blew up and pasted onto the walls. 
A lot of it was, yeah. A lot of it yeah. was. They they put they pasted entire um, walls with photographs, partly because they didn't want reflections. Here's a few more things you need to know. Let me just like we got to sort of back up a little bit. Tati was a perfectionist. He was a kind of Stanley Kubrick mode kind of perfectionist. This was his baby. This was his dream. After doing other films that he was relatively proud of, this was a dream that people were like, "You're crazy. You can't. This isn't going to work. You can't do this." And he was like, "I don't care. I'm doing it anyway." Raised an enormous amount of money, went completely bankrupt making this movie. This movie nearly killed him, okay? The other thing you need to know about Tati is the way he films things. I just want to set that up early, too, so people get a feel for this. He never did close-ups. No close-ups. Never, never did close-ups. Yeah. This is taken to this extreme where basically everything in playtime is sort of your your peripheral vision is almost as important as what's in the center. It was shot on 70 millimeter. It, you know, as wide as he could get it, as big and wide as he could get it. And you have at all times all kinds of things going on that you don't even know where to look. And in fact, you could kind of choose your own movie in a way. You can almost look at this corner and decide to look here. And then the next time you watch it, decide to look in this corner and you'll see something yeah, completely different. It's true. The wide tableaus, there's often things like the more I see the movie, the more things I notice going on in the background and in the corners. In most of the scenes, the characters are filmed head to toe. You can always see their feet. As a cartoonist, he's composing these shots the way a cartoonist composes cartoons. And it really is uh, remarkable to me. And it reminds me of, of, of comics and of cartoons. Uh, I, absolutely. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. It reminds me of yeah. specifically gag cartoons, specifically like your kind of cartoons. So Joe, as you know, is a New Yorker cartoonist. And it's yeah. really it really reminds me of a series and it's not just the composition it's the gags themselves you know the gags are just and that's the other thing so again we implied that there's no plot really to this movie what it is is it's more than two hours of little gags gag after yeah. gag after gag after gag yeah, as yeah. if you were just like flipping through a book of new yorker cartoons now we should mention um tati was very good friends with sempe yeah. he was a new yorker cartoonist you know i'm I, i'm gonna guess he loved that stuff the movie posters, which are all fabulous, all of his movie posters are fabulous. You can picture them as like covers of the New Yorker. You know, he had that sensibility in like what he chose for the artwork, you know, in, in his um, promotional materials. You know, it's very New Yorker, it seems yeah. to me. Right? But it's also very, it, I mean, it, it's also very similar. The, like the wide tableaus where there's a so, so many people and so much going on, it reminds me a lot of Tintin cartoons mm -hmm. about those like Egg Ray's splash pages where there are characters in the foreground and background and you see streets and things going on and it's very similar um, to what uh, Tati is doing. And it was done around the same time. Uh, and I think, I, I, I'm sure there was some, some back and forth influence going on there. It's a very long movie. It's um, over two hours. Now this movie, he had it much longer in the beginning. It was cut down several times uh, over and over again. And, and his script was even longer. So at this point, it's a little over two hours. And there are lost scenes that, um, you know, they haven't been able to reconstruct from the very original, original print. Well, I'll tell you my, my experience with the film was, um, and I'm going to gesture with the pipe because I feel this is important. Oh, yes. Um, my, I, I didn't really know that much about Tati the first time I saw this. And it was only very recently that I saw, that I saw it for the first time. I didn't know what to expect going into this. And, and, and I kind of had the wrong impression of it. I assumed it would be or similar to Chaplin. I thought it would be like, you know, modern times or something like that. You know, I thought it was this this simpleton versus technology type of story. And then I and then I the first time I sat down to watch Playtime, I have to say, this will be the experience of most people watching Playtime for the first time. About a little while into it, you start to say, what the hell am I watching? Yeah. What's going on? What is this movie? Is this even a movie? What is going on? And then you realize what the movie wants to show you is not anything that you that you're expecting, and then you come to love it. And then I, over time, I've watched it a number of times, and it's become maybe one of my favorite films ever made. I think it's it feels almost like a movie that was made for me. Uh, I, I I'm a person because we when whenever we're on this show, we talk about the locations in movies. I'm obsessed with with environments in movies. And when I find a movie with an environment that I want to climb into and live in, I get very excited and I get kind of obsessive about that. And I don't think there is a movie with, an, with a place I want to live in more than this. Uh, it's all about the environment. The environment is the movie. Yeah. I find after I watch this movie or even other Tati's 
when I'm just walking the streets, I'm listening to everything differently. You know, you, yeah, you, you yeah. it takes like a day. It'll take you like 24 hours to kind of snap out of that mode of just suddenly hearing things differently. I'll give you the, I'll give you the hat. You'll, you won't have to ever snap out <laughs> of it. That's right. Let me read you something about the people, the first viewing. Do you want to hear about the test screening? I, I, yeah, I imagine it didn't go over well. <laughs> Out of every, this is a quote from somebody, I'm not sure who actually, but it's from, it, it's a good source. Don't worry. It's real. It's real. It's real. I just don't have the exact person. Out of every 10 spectators asked, one claimed to have enjoyed the film, three admitted having been made to smile, but the remaining six, as they emerged from the two and a half hour show, that was the original version, looking as glum as the grave, had the same refrain, Tati e Fini. <laughs> now, these people love Tati. These people love Tati. They loved Hilo. Yeah. He, his earlier movies were very popular, very popular. So this is really, you know, it was really something for people to see. Suddenly, this very arty film coming out of this crowd-pleasing film director who like, won an yeah, Oscar, by yeah. the way, you know, or his earlier film. He was most famous for having a character called uh, Mr. Hulo. He's played by Tati himself. Yeah, who was very much like a precursor. If you've never seen Hulo, the easiest way to describe him, he was kind of a precursor to Mr. Bean. He was a mostly silent character. He could speak. He wasn't Harpo Marx. He, he, he could speak, but none of his humor came from uh, his speech or anything verbal. His humor was all physical, and he usually... Um, and when I say usually, he, he appeared in a scant few films as this character. Really only four films where he plays this character. He didn't make that many films, yeah. Yeah, and arguably arguably Playtime may not even be one of them. It is, it is. Um, it is. Basically, he's a, he's a very unassuming uh, kind of benign presence. Um, he's a little bit childlike, but not in a kind of off-putting way not in a way that where i find mr bean off-putting because he is so childlike he's he's almost like a terrible two-year-old scary, in the form of an scary adult and, i don't like mr yeah, bean i don't like yeah mr. he's a bean. scary child hulo's not like that he's a guy who seems to come from the 19th century and he's in the 20th century and that seems to be the theme of all of his films he's surrounded by a technological world and he's not sure how it works and he often seems to get into trouble and be unwitting. He's non-aggressive. He's a completely benign presence. Even though he might walk into a room and knock things over or cause the ceiling to fall down um, or cause a glass door to break, it's never because of his uh, aggression in any way. Well, the, so the movies leading up to this, it's a series on Hulo, and it begin. Well, we're, you know, we're going to talk about that later, but it's like the holiday of Monsieur Hulo was the first one, one in between, and then there was playtime, and then one after, and and it's there's a, it's sort of an interesting progression where he's being somewhat eliminated from the movies. Um, actually, Tati wanted to kind of get rid of him. He didn't want, you know, he was sort of like a crowd pleasing thing, and he was, you know, the artiste, and he was a little like, oh, do you really want to see Hulo again? And but you know, he kind of felt like the audience demanded it. So what's interesting about Playtime is Hulo is really, just like everything in the movie, a little bit in the background. He's sort of this this flowing um, character that is never center stage, but is always kind of, you know, setting off things happening. He does a very interesting thing in Playtime, which is um, not only does he make Hulo a supporting character, but there's all these other Hulos walking around. Yeah. He has about four or five doubles for himself walking around through the movie, who one of them is even black. All right, let, yeah. let's get into some of the um, details on uh, the production of this. So the preceding film to this was Mon Oncle, which won an Oscar, right? That was from 1958. He conceived of Playtime in 1959, and it didn't come out till 67. During that time, between 58 and 67, everything changed. You basically had the French New Wave. You had Antonioni, you had Fellini, you had all this stuff coming out. It was a different world between Mon Oncle and playtime and that's one interesting thing about playtime is a, it's a little bit weirdly out of its time because he conceived it so much earlier and didn't execute it until much later because he yeah. had so much trouble raising the funds and then you know of course building the place and it took 365 days to film it broke a record as far as most expensive film ever made in france eventually that record was broken by polanski's test and then recently broken by Luc Bresson's Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, 
2017. That That broke all records. That's the most expensive movie ever made. Yeah, well, that was basically Star Wars. (laughs) Star Wars in French is what that was. That's what that was. And um, it also broke it record at the time. Playtime was the longest shoot, longest continuous shoot, broken, of course, eventually by Mr. Kubrick with Eyes Wide Shut, which I believe is a record that has not been broken since. Hmm. It's kind of timeless, and if you watch it out of time, uh, it you see it's it's a masterpiece now. That's the thing. It makes much more sense seeing it way out of time than it did in 67. And that was one of the reasons it wasn't as big a success is because it, it like a lot of these themes had been done, you know, these sort of modernist themes and this minimalism. It actually, you know, it was really novel in 58 by 67. It wasn't quite as novel. So that's part of the problem. But now we can, you know, like you said, we can really appreciate it. Nine months of editing, nine months of editing. Uh, let me just say, budget was 2.5 million francs was the budget, and it cost more than 15 million. So he went way, 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 way over budget. He borrowed from everybody he could get his hands on, every friend, business associate, and relative, and it never made the money back. Tativille was set up east of Paris, again, designed by Eugene Roman. Um, more than half the budget was spent on this set, 38,700 square feet of plastic, 31,500 square feet of timber, 486,000 square feet of concrete, five months of construction, two power stations large enough for a town of 15,000 people, skyscrapers with movable walls that could swing out, skyscrapers, not just rooms, skyscrapers. Yeah. Entire buildings on rails that you could glide. These were small-ish buildings. They were, there was a lot of forced perspective. So you'd have like these little skyscrapers on rails that you could just wheel by around the background, put them wherever you want. Um, a working a traffic signal system. These were real streets. You know, they, he set up a whole, you know, real pavement streets with working traffic signals. Working elevators, working escalators in all the buildings. And another entire town just for the production team. Okay, he actually, what he wanted was, um, with this creation that he built, he wanted to make it into a film school. Uh, That was his dream, was that people would use these sets forever to train filmmakers. But no, it was all, as soon as the filming was done, they bulldozed it all. They bulldozed it all. I feel so, yeah, it's so sad. I wish it was still there like like the Popeye set from Robert Altman. I wish they'd left it up and made it into a theme park. They already have the perfect name for it. Why not? There was one um, episode of my podcast, The Shining 237, where we talked about nothing but sets. And we had talked about the Popeye set and some of the other really, you know, because obviously The Shining had this incredibly ambitious set. Well, this is, and, it, and like I said, Metropolis, um, uh, Morneau's, um, what's that movie called? Sunrise. You know, these are some, yeah. just some of the legendary, legendary sets of all time. You know, just, you know, it, you're crazy. You're just nuts to make these sets. My goal is to someday rebuild Tativille. <laughs> Yeah. Just for myself and Wouldn't live that there. Nice? That's all I want. Someone do. did rebuild the, the yeah. Mononcle house somewhere in Paris. Oh, really? Someone, yeah, somewhere that stands well, that's like a, a, rep, a replica does stand somewhere in Paris. That's, I believe that's special. Oh, I would love to go see that. Yeah, um, yeah. and of course the, the Hulot's Holiday, the hotel was a real hotel and is still there. Uh, looks yeah. pretty much the same to this day. There's a monument to uh, Tati there, a, a bronze statue. Now, um, part of the way that he, you know he had he had to try to raise money anyway he could. There's uh, there is some product placement in this movie. You may notice a little product placement. I saw, yeah, I saw a Marlboro cigarette sign. I saw some Kellogg cornflakes in the drugstore. Well, they have that. They have a expo, so you see like Phillips. Yeah, there's a Phillips or neon sign in the background of a few yeah. shots. Yeah. You know, uh, so that paid for about 10% of the cost of the movie, and, but they had a really hard time getting people to agree to that because it was already in the air that this was going to be a disaster. There was like, you yeah. know, he had he was up against a lot. People were already like, yeah, this isn't going to. But um, so it's uh, notably is the airline. So this a lot of this takes place in an airport. They couldn't get an airline to sponsor them, so they just made up an airport, airline. But, you know, they really wanted to like have, you know, TWA or something like that. Um, you'll also know. So now the cast is interesting. So... Th- Tati was known to to not want to work with actors, really. He wanted to work with real people. He wanted authenticity. He wanted your everyday. He wanted sort of like we were talking about with the, what we do in the shadows, guys. You know, they, he knew how to work and he knew how to appreciate the average looking person. You know, the not the beautiful star or, or handsome young man. He wanted normal looking people. and He wanted people who could act like they weren't acting, right? There's a lot of... Uh... There's a lot of Walters walking around. Yeah. There's a lot of these like grotty little doughy men with mustaches and bald heads and just staring kind of blank faced, you yeah. know, and, I, and I, I, I could point to at least three or four real life 
real life Walters. Definitely. Now, the, the, that little gaggle of tourist ladies, the American tourist ladies, that those were uh, officers' wives from who were they were the husbands were doing something at NATO, and they were in town with their husbands. They were discovered by uh, someone who sort of became an assistant to Tati, who noticed they were having a bake sale. She went to the bake sale. It was like it was like a bake contest, a cake cake baking contest, and she went. She was like, "Oh my God." These women are perfect. And she dragged Tati over to see them and he hired them on the spot. And it's it, they're perfect. You know, he didn't even change their clothing. The only thing he did was give them flowered hats. They all have artificial flower hats. Barbara, the, so the, the star besides Hulo, the, the star is this woman, Barbara, right? She's just a, a woman who's part of this tourist group. She's kind of the youngest one in this tourist group. And um, she's just a lovely, quiet, you know, kind of demure woman enjoying America. She's supposed to be American, um, enjoying Paris. And she yeah, was... it's her first time in Paris. She's presented... Yeah. She's this very sort of sweet, innocent uh, young woman. He's had that kind of role in, a, in one or two of his movies, this sort of woman who's just like kind of very attractive, but in a not in a, you know, movie star way, but just, you know, kind of like your next door neighbor attractive, who um, Hulo kind of gravitates towards. And there's nothing really that sexual about it, but it's just a really sweet, you know, kind of relationship. Yeah, yeah. They keep running into each other there. You could say they're the main characters of the movie if the movie has had main characters. Right. Yeah. So she was um, she was an au pair, an au pair who was doing work as an au pair up the street from Tati. He'd see her walking to the bus and he'd like pull over and be like, hey, want to ride? I'll drive you to the bus. That's how he met her. And that's how he knew her was just from the neighborhood. And um, he asked her to do this. And she said, no, she wasn't interested. She's not an actress. She, you know, she was like, what are you talking about? Um, she eventually this took so much time to make that. The au pair job disappeared, and she ended up working. The child at a, was in college by that. Yeah, time. the child was in college, and um, she ended up in a frozen food supplier. She ended up working for a frozen food supplier. At that point, when Tati asked her again, she said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Let's do." This. She was like, yeah. "Sure, I'll do this." So, yeah. I wonder I, if the I, frozen food she was supplying was as unappetizing <laughs> as the food in this movie. Yes, I love that. All the food in this movie <laughs> well, is just, so disgusting. It's, it's so disgusting. Yeah, Purposefully like those, disgusting. Yeah. Those bad jello concoctions you see from the 50s. You know. Yes, there's a great scene in the drugstore where they look at these desserts and they are just... A nightmare. They're a nightmare. They're so horrifying. They, they don't look, look like, like food at all. No, yeah. they don't. And then when yeah. you're in the fancy restaurant, the Royal Gardens is the centerpiece of the movie is this very, very long scene, very long scene, 45 minute scene of this restaurant dance club called the Royal Garden. And the food that they're serving that's part of the joke is you're like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, so, all right. So that's Barbara. Now, here's a little something that nobody talks about. I've noticed. I looked at a lot of docs and looked at a lot of books and went to the New York Public Library of Performing Arts and dug around. And I only found this in one source and it was only two sentences. But here's a little something you don't normally hear. Oh, well, I'll need to think about this. So let me get yes. ready. Yes. I'm ready to think now. You better hang on to your chapeau. But Tati had an affair with Barbara. Yes, he did. He had an affair with Barbara. He was a happily married man, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, I was, I don't, I'm I've glad never I had heard, the pipe. Yeah, I'm yeah. You don't really ready. hear people talking about that. They had an affair. It didn't last the whole movie. The movie was 365 days. So like most affairs, it did not last 365 days. And sadly, what happened was, yeah, it was uncomfortable when they broke up, when it ended. They, was, they had an uncomfortable time working together for part of that movie. And maybe you can sense that a little bit like towards the end when they're in that souvenir store and he's picking up that scarf. You might have a little feeling of a little bit of coldness between them. I don't know. Maybe it's my imagination. I can't say I blame him. You, you fall in love with Barbara. In the movie, she's just purity. She's she's purity, right? She's purity, right? Isn't she, she? I mean, yeah. she's she doesn't have a ton of personality, but it's like kind of an archetypal demure sweet lady, you know. One of the things I love about this movie is there's there is nothing special about her, and I think the movie celebrates that there's nothing special about a lot of people, but that that's that's fine. It's a, it's such a positive film to me because it just it, it it just presents this image of ordinary people going about their lives as kind of wonderful. And, and you know what extreme it takes it to is um, that some of the people in this movie are literal cardboard cutouts. Like there's actual cardboard mm -hmm. cutouts of people in the back. I didn't notice them actually. I, I, couldn't, I, did, I, couldn't, I couldn't spot any. I'm going to have to go I, through I again. spotted a few, yeah. Yeah, the cubicle scene, there's two fake people standing outside the building. You can see them through the window. They're just standing in one place because they're cardboard cutouts. 
Yeah, I'll have to look that up. Also, look for Tati and other, he does little other roles. The only one I spotted him was as a traffic cop. As, as a, yeah, as a traffic cop, which was something he did when he was, in his early days, when he was a mime, he used to do these traffic cop routines, you know, like, you know, like you can imagine a mime playing it up, you know. And um, so you'll notice him, like, right before Barbara starts talking to the flower lady, the Parisian flower seller, you'll see Tati in the background directing traffic like a maniac. Yeah. Yeah, it's when 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 Barbara and the group of women, I think, are it's when they're coming out of the travel agent's place, which yeah. looks exactly like the airport, which looks exactly like the office building. It's all like like gray steel. They're coming out of the travel agents. And then you see uh, the traffic cop in the background. And it's, and it's actually Tati um, directing traffic, which he would go on to do years later. Yes, he, directed he did. He directed traffic. traffic. That's you will as you will see. Literally. Tra literally. Traffic. Foreshadowing. Traffic. Now, um, one of that we, that leads me to one of my favorite jokes in the whole movie, and I think that we are the comedy film funnel. As as uh, sorrowful as we may think that name is, we are the comedy film funnel. We can't get it. We can't get out of it. There's no escaping it. So and I think we, we need to talk talk about funnels enough on this show, and I think I'd like to. I, I have I think, issue with that. I think I think we, we, we need to talk about the comedy of this the... film. Let's talk about some of the gags. The first thing you should we we need to say is these gags are very gentle. Tati was inspired by Buster Keaton. He, when he won the Oscar for Mon Oncle, they said, what famous actors do you want to meet? Which women and men do you want to meet? You know, everybody expected him to say Sophia Loren. He said Buster Keaton, Max Sennett, uh, Stan Laurel, and um, I, and was Harold Lloyd alive? Someone else like that. And yeah, that was it. That's what he wanted because those were his greatest inspiration. He took it to a different place. He took silent movie comedy, which was, of course, very heavy handed, and took it to a gentler place this is these jokes are very gentle they're very soft they're very tiptoe and I mean sometimes I think it's a little too soft you know for me I wish he had ramped up some of these jokes a, a little bit in, in all of his I'm talking about all of his movies um you know for him like a joke is a little girl in a food market knocking over a couple tomatoes that fall and and burst and then the little girl runs off and then and then Hulo kind of clumsily walks to where the girl was and the, the market vendor goes, oh, you broke my tomatoes. And Hula's like, huh? And that's the joke. You know, that's the kind of a typical, yeah, yeah. it's very like real life, stuff that could really happen, very subtle, very sweet. But to me, almost to a point where it's, a, you know, I wish he'd take it a little further off. And so let's talk about the gags. Well, this, but this movie is filled with more like surreal gags. There's more things that are like these sort of puzzle gags. That again, it it's so much like some of the great uh, wordless New Yorker cartoons that that you've seen, like Saul Steinberg's work. You know, um, is a great example of the kind of thing that that it reminds me of in a way. These these super simple jokes, like the thing of a bunch of guys installing a pane of glass, and they're trying to handle it so delicately that it looks like they're four dancers in a line. Yeah, and so people start playing music. Yeah, that goes along with them, and I and and it's just such a such a a silly little observation joke, you know, or things like the thing I think you were thinking of where they they go into the travel agent posters, and all of the posters show the exact same building, the posters for London yeah. and and uh, Spain and yeah, and they all show the exact same same building, and then they walk out, and there's that building. It's right yeah. there in Paris too. That's the best joke. Now, again, I think, you know, the unfortunate thing is he hits it so hard. At some point he has, he just has um, Barbara just staring at these posters. He's like, dude, you're taking this in, right? You're taking, you're getting this joke, right? You're getting this joke. You know, he hits the jokes very hard. I think yeah. a little too hard. And then there's a, like little things like the, like the, like the gag in the uh, nightclub of them, uh, of the, the, the tile that comes off of the floor. And so they have, uh, uh, the uh, guy comes to fix the tile and he's spreading the glue on the tile in the background at the same time as the waiter in the foreground is describing how they put the sauce on the fish. Yes. And it's the ex same exact motion. And that's, a, that's a very typical Tati gag yeah, where you have yeah. a reflection. You have two things happening that are exactly the same. And, and then a lot of optical illusions. Like, so you have the door guy is about to light the cigarette of a, a, a guy who's standing in front of him, and then you realize there's a pane of glass in between them. There's no way of actually lighting the cigarette because there's a pane of glass between them. Lots of right. So there's tons of panes of glass in this. You know, this whole thing is glass, 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 and, and all the walls are glass from, you know, ceiling to floor, side to side, both in the 
skyscrapers and the office buildings, but also in people's homes, you know. And so he makes hay with that. Um, and, for, for, you know, one of the most famous gags, of course, is the door shattering. I think that's the one, maybe the joke that I see the most in documentaries, um, where there is a glass door opening and shutting. This is the one going to the Royal Garden. And um, Huyolo accidentally shatters the entire glass door. But his friend, who is the doorman, is holding on to the doorknob. And he's so embarrassed, they quickly scoop all the glass away. And he conti- he doesn't want anybody to know that just happened because he's going to get in trouble. So he just keeps opening and shutting that doorknob. And what's really interesting is if you listen, you know, with headphones, like I did, you'll hear that there's a difference in sound between when the door's open and the door shut, even oh, though there's no, so, there's so no door there. Yeah, but you hear the, sound, the difference in sound. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. But that's a great, great gag. There's little gags like, um, like it opens with the two nuns walking by and the little sort of wings of their hat are just flapping in unison, you know, together like, like the wings of a bird. You know, it's full of little things like that. And again, it reminds me of like, like Saul Steinberg drawings, you know. Yeah, and it's never mean-spirited. No, so, so here's the thing. All of Tati's movies are absolutely 100% hardcore rated G. Now, you could show any kid any age any of these movies, and you do not have to worry. I want to talk about the expo. You know, this is a statement on modernism. And so, you know, he does this kind of very obvious thing, which is he has an expo, uh, sort of the, right, like it's sort of like the, the thing they have in Las Vegas every year where it's supposed to be the latest in yeah. technology. The best one, absolutely, is the door that slams with that, that shuts and opens without any sound. That's, right. it's a door you could slam it. You could be as angry as you want to be, as slam it as hard as you want, and it won't make a sound. With modern technology, it's completely silent. And that's, yeah. kind, of, that's kind of a great idea, right? But then the guy, the guy running the booth gets so upset set at Hulo and slams the door and I sort of feel bad for him because he can't exactly he can't get his point across you realize that you actually need that satisfaction you yeah, do you need yeah, it. You yeah. Need it. this woman demonstrating these glasses that you can flip them up and put on your mascara just by flipping them up and putting them back down there's a broom with um with headlights this is a lot of housewife stuff this is why he feels a little dated you know I think for 67 it probably looked a little silly I'm gonna guess oh it's absurd it's the 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 Trash can shaped like a Roman column. Yes. This is, this is the silliest stuff in the world. Yeah. You know? But I don't think he thinks, I think he thinks it's silly, but I don't think it's any kind of, it's not meant as any kind of sharp criticism of technology or of modern life. I think it's more of a sort of amusement at it. Well, he went out of his way to say that he wasn't trying to make a statement. I mean, he's made a few statements about the statement of playtime. I can read you a few. The general theme of playtime can be summed up thus. In the planned and organized world that is being got ready for us, where everything is directed towards improving working conditions and infrastructure, there remains a place for individuals as long as they keep enough of their individualism and personality. And that is what is peculiar to the French. You can adapt anything available to their own needs and nature. Um, And he again talks about the French. He says, whatever the architecture and however much one town may look like another, l'esprit français will always survive, which is kind of funny because he has a lot of Americans in this movie who do pretty, you know, they kind of embody what he's talking about, you know. If he was making any kind of point, I didn't think it was specific to the French. And I think that's the strength of the movie is, you know, it doesn't feel like it's only about France. It feels like it's about the whole universe because it takes place in a in a made up universe in a way, in a, in a fictional in a fictional land. Yeah. Now, another of the major themes, um, which we might have just barely touched on, but it's very important is straight lines versus circles and roundness, straight lines versus curves. So the movie famously starts off with everybody walking in straight lines, like right angles, the whole thing. The visuals are very straightforward. You're getting used to getting taking in these buildings and glass panels of glass everywhere. As the movie progresses, he did this purposefully. You see more and more people walking a little more in a curved fashion. You do see a little more color even. But um, it, it leads up to, again, the centerpiece of the movie is the restaurant scene, the Royal Gardens, where you actually have people dancing their asses off. And so suddenly you're yeah. really, you know, it goes from this very staid straight line thing to people really kind of going nuts and, and dancing. And then the finale of the movie famously is a complete circle. It's a roundabout. It's yeah, a I roundabout. Yeah. And that is, you literally, he hovers on the cars going around and around this roundabout for a very long time, just telling you, we are now in a complete circle this is the conclusion, and you know we are in an opposite place we were at the beginning of the movie. So there's several things that are that make playtime its own animal. One is that 
it's a minimalist comedy, which you don't see too much. Like minimalist movies, you generally, again, are talking about, you know, 2001, Kubrick's 2001, Antonioni, you know, maybe Fellini, or you're talking about, um, um, what was I thinking of? Um, something earlier. But, but, you know, you think of like, um, things that are very staid, things that are slow burn. You know, we're getting a little more back into that now. We have a lot more slow burn movies in the 21st century. You have a lot of slow burn movies, which I really enjoy. But, you know, he was, you know, he was doing this thing that was sort of happening in the late 60s, which was having a lot more, you know, silence in movies and, and a lot more of a minimalist take. But for him, it was doing it via comedy, which was really unique. You yeah, didn't see yeah. that, you know. The last thing I want to say as far as this uniqueness of a comedy is that, you know, it, it, like I'm sort of complaining a little bit that it's a little too retro in some ways because of when it was conceived. But at the same time, you got to admit, it's quite visionary. We see cubicles. You know, he predicted cubicles, which I, you know, we've, I, I've worked in cubicles, man. He got, he nailed it. He also later, by the way, made a commercial for Lloyd's of London, which never aired in which he had a machine spitting out money before there was anything that resembled an ATM in wow. existence. Yes. Do you want to now take a break and talk about Tati? Yes, I would like to hear more about Tati. Okay, let's I talk would like about to learn Tati. more about Tati. I actually know very, very little about him. Oh, I'm a, man, I'm going to tell you all about Tati. All right, pull up a chair, kids. Pull up a chair. Uh, Jacques Tati. I'll get one peep. Pull up a peep and uh, hold on to your chapeau. All right. Jacques Tati Chef. Tati Chef is his full name. And he's born in 1908. 1908. He uh, is of Dutch, Italian, and Russian ancestry. Now, I just want to, talk, if you don't mind, talk about his grandfather because it's interesting. His grandfather was Russian. This is his father's side. General of the Imperial Russian Army, military attaché of the Russian embassy in Paris. So he is a Russian guy who ended up in Paris and ended up falling in love with a Parisian. They had a son who was Tati's father. When this child was a baby, the father died mysteriously. The grandfather, Russian grandfather died mysteriously. He left on his horse and his horse came home without him and they don't know what happened. They think he was assassinated. They think he was assassinated. Now, mm. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what, that was going on, all right? That was going on. That was on. pretty common. That was pretty common. Was, most people died that way at the time. And most people in Europe were dying of assassination. No, if, you know, there was a lot of Russian escapees. I can't help thinking of Nabokov, because I was just thinking about him. You know, the same thing, where um, their family escaped Russia without their fortune. So these are aristocrats. So throughout Europe, you would, you would find aristocratic Russians who were your tailors, who were your you know, janitors, because they lost their fortune to get the hell out of Russia. And so there was a lot of families like that. I can't help thinking Nabokov's father was assassinated also. Um, mm. So the grandfather was assassinated. And what happened was the Russian family that was still in Russia, I swear to you, this is what's in all the books on Tati. They kidnapped the father. They kidnapped Tati's father and kidnapped him back to Russia. The mother was left in Paris with no child. And she by God, she learned Russian, Joe. She learned Russian and got into Russia and pretended to be a nanny, got jobs as a nanny, and kidnapped her son back. Wow. So when his father grew up, he married a woman who came from generations of framers, people who made frames, craftspeople of frames, who actually made the frames for, they say, Toulouse-Lautrec and, rumor has it, Van Gogh. And that they would allow Van Gogh to not pay, by the way. That's, that's the family stories. They would be like, don't worry, Van Gogh. Don't worry, Van Gogh. Yeah, we, well, you, we got your tab going. Don't worry. <laughs> they knew that guy was a deadbeat. I could th that's I a mean, family you story. One, one, one look at that guy, you know, you're, not getting, you're never getting paid. So that was a pretty good business. They were very, very well-respected framers. And he got into the framing business. They all were in the framing business at that, you know, the, his, so Tati's father framed. And they did very well. They had a very comfortable life. They went on all these great vacations, just like they do in the movies. He had, a, you know, lived in a nice house and had a nice education and all that stuff. He had one older sister. He was very athletic. Um, didn't do great in school, but he was great at athletics. And um, when he was a young man, he fell in love with rugby and became quite the sportsman. And um, to crack up his teammates, he would do pantomimes of sports people. The referee, he'd make fun of the referee. He'd make fun of whoever, the goalie. I don't know. Is there a goalie in rugby? I'm pretty sure there's there a goalie and there's a, and there's a catcher and there's a, and there's a quarterback. He did that. He did all that stuff. 
Um, he also got into tennis and a bunch. Of, he just was a real athlete. And and he actually, he was cracking people up so much that they asked him to start performing this at, like, you know, whatever silly events they had at the clubhouse. You know, the club, you know, they'd have a talent show or whatever. He was doing these things. You know, he was just an absolute huge hit that he actually developed this into an act where it was a complete performance where he would play a tennis racket. He'd sometimes play the sports equipment himself. He'd play a horse. He'd play a man on a horse. And people referred to him as a centaur because he was so good at being both the man and the horse at the same time. It was the toast. And so he said to his dad, people like this, I'm going to do this for a living. And his father just cut him out. He's like, you're, you're not getting another dime from me if you do something that ridiculous. He ended up performing this. Yes, at cabarets, circuses, he would perform in circuses doing this act and eventually worked his way up into a little nightclub where he was performing with someone who was completely unknown and her name was Edith Piaf. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The inventor of Rice Piaf. <laughs> yes. That's how I know her, right? That, uh, the owner of that club, by the way, is murdered. He's, those are the kind of joints he was playing. And so eventually he just worked his way up. At one point he was, did a performance with Chevalier, you know. Are you sure that was Chevalier? <laughs> It may, have been, it may have been Groucho. I don't know. It don't look like Chevalier. Now, during this up-and-coming time, he met a woman, and they had a child. And he decided he didn't want any part of that. So this is going to factor in later. They had a daughter, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to participate in this. And he left them. So that will factor later into the story. Um, but so he, he continued to do well and he did eventually meet someone else and, and got married and had, you know, two kids. So, and, and then he started getting bit parts in films, you know, he's, he ended up being well-connected. People loved him. And so, you know, he's, he was all in on the clown scene, you know, he's doing circuses. He's done, so him and a, like a clown made a short film. He started starring in and writing short films. There's a few of them floating out there. Some of them are okay. And some of them are terrible actually. Eventually, he, he did a bit part in a major movie, and that producer really liked him, and that's when he started directing. So they put together this thing called L'École de Facteur, School for Postmen, 1947. And that was a short that he wasn't supposed to direct, but the director kind of dropped out. He ended up directing it and starring in it. He played a postman. That one's a good one. It's a really good little short. And that got a lot of critical acclaim, and that's what led to his first feature film. First feature film was Your Defet, 1949, Day of the Festival. Had, did you watch that? No, I haven't seen that one. Okay. That is a lovely, lovely movie. He ended up living in this rural area, and he fell in love with it. He fell in love with the people, so he decided to do the whole film there. He revived The Postman from that earlier short and expanded it, used a lot of the same jokes and expanded it. And in the whole story is, it's again, a minimalist comedy, where all it is is this lovely rural town, this this sort of festival. You know, they were, that was very common, it's just festival days. They'd construct a merry-go-round. They'd construct booth games where you throw the thing to knock the bottles down. They had a little maybe cinema. If they had a little cinema, you know, they would show that. The postman ends up seeing a film of an American postman doing his job much better than him, and he tries to improve his way of delivering mail. It's a series of failed delivery of mail from this mm -hmm. Inept Postman, and that's the whole comedy of it. There's a fair amount of dialogue, and it's lovely. Lovely. There was a company that came up with a color process, um, and he didn't know if it was going to really take because it was so new that he filmed it both in black and white and in color. Indeed, this company went out of business before they were done, and so the film is famously in black and white but was shot in color. They eventually, his daughter revived it in color. She figured out how to do it, and now you can see it in color. Oh, that's, that's cool. So then the next one is Les Vacances de Monsieur Hulot, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. Which is in black and white. 1953, and that's in black and white. Explain the story a little bit for people who don't know it at all. Uh, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. Monsieur Hulot goes on a holiday. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And that's the plot. That, that is the plot. Yeah, he goes to a hotel and it ends with everyone saying goodbye, see you next summer. You're just following along all these people, just playing on the beach, going on a picnic, you know, having a little party, and you're just following them, and it's just little gags, little yeah. minute gags all along the way. Annoying people gags. He opens the door while everybody's in the lounge, and the wind just blows everything, you know, so people are pouring tea, and the, the tea is just flying away. That sort of thing. But then, you know, some clever, more clever designed gags here and there. I love that film, but I wonder, I wonder what the genesis of the character was. I can like, what it. inspired him to create this 
this Hugh Lowe character. Well, so everybody wanted him to do The Postman again. The po- so we should say that Jure Lafette was a big success. It was a big success. People loved it. It was actually quite celebrated in France. And people loved The Postman, and they begged him to do another film with this postman. And he already was like, I'm done. I'm done with The Postman. And this character, Monsieur Hulot, was based on an army guy, someone he met in the army. So he actually spent some time in the military. Um, I should have mentioned that. In between the cabaret stuff and the shorts, there was some military time. So he is based on a real person somewhat. But also Tati did want to expand his comedy palette, the palette of the movie, so that it was a little less focused on a main character. And you'll see immediately, it's, there's a big difference between this movie and Le Jour de Fête in that it's not a typical follow the postman through the movie, which is what Jure de Fête is. But Hulot is already in Les Vacances. It, it, you're, he's already not quite, not quite dead center character, right? He is, yeah, but he, he's not. He isn't really. He, he isn't really. One of the things I love about that film is it's so counterintuitive to something like a Chaplin comedy or a Keaton comedy or something later on, like a who was compared to him was Jerry Lewis. And where whereas all of those comedies, the guy is at the center. You know, with the case of Jerry Lewis, I know that, that you know, he was a an egomaniac. So, he, of course, the, the movie is completely and utterly about not only him, but it's about making you feel sorry for him. Yeah. And... I've never been a big Chaplin fan, and I think it's that, that forced pathos of, like, the whole movie is, feel sorry for this guy. You're going to shed a tear for this sad little little sack, this little tramp, you know, and, and you don't get that with Hulo. It's, he's, nothing really bad happens to him, and you're not asked to pity him in any way. It's never that cloying sort of a thing. He causes trouble and mayhem, and sometimes people get annoyed with him. Other Most of the times people are just amused, but also he's not, like, beloved by children the way like Jerry Lewis would always portray himself as the you know the guy who who children love and follow down the street because he's a sad clown or whatever or any of that you don't get any of that stuff I'll give you a quote from Tati about Hulo Hulo is not really a character he's just a fellow on the road and um, another thing he said was Hulo does not know things they come to him he's flypaper he does not look for things it is for you to find him. It is for you to decide whether he is your friend or just someone you would not care to invite into your house. One of the things I love about him is the, is, is the walk. In playtime, all of the fake hulos, they're doing the same walk, and that's why people think it's him. He's doing this walk where he's walking kind of on the balls of his feet. Because he's up on his toes, he always seems to be tilted forward a little as he bounces along. Yeah, he's like an angle. Yeah, it's it's a perfectly choreographed lack of coordination. Yeah, yeah. I should have mentioned earlier, um, you know, when he was doing the sports uh, pantomiming, you know, he did develop some other acts, including a drunken waiter act. He did, again, the traffic cop kind of thing. He did, And so he became a full-fledged mime. He was a full-fledged mime. He didn't have mime training. But he is very good at it. It's all humor that you use your body to to pull off. Yeah, he he he's sort of rem- reminiscent of Ray Bolger a little bit, because of the sort of like loose limbed thing when he goes into the the uh, offices that are have the perfectly shiny floor and he slips on the floor. It reminds me of Ray Bolger yeah. as the scarecrow. I can see that. Yeah. Now yeah. you see a precursor to Barbara here, which is this woman. I'm forgetting her name because you know they never say her name really. But she's got, she's a blonde girl with like Princess Leia buns. It's kind of funny, Prince Leia buns. And um, she's just sort of that, that, she was basically almost the same character, their parallel, where she's just this, you know, kind of floating through the movie and kind of has, they catch each other as friend, in a friendly way. You know, they're kind of back and forth thing a little bit. It, as the movie goes on, they become more and more friendly, but n- it never it develops into a romance or anything like that. It's just sweet, innocent fun. And she's very quiet, very quiet and demure and the whole thing. Um, and just kind of observing all these people and kind of giggling at them, but without causing the havoc yeah, that he's yeah. causing. So it's two interesting little bits of trivia about this movie. One is that the scene where there's a boat that kind of folds in half, and it ends up looking like a shark. And so the boat folds in half, and it looks like it kind of has teeth, and it looks like a shark from a distance. And suddenly everyone on the beach goes, shark, and runs away. That was filmed, guess when? That was not filmed originally. That was not in the original film. Believe it or not, believe it or not, he filmed that after seeing Jaws, and they inserted it. If you look at it, you'll see it's different from the rest of the film. Really? Yes. It's so weird. It's so weird. He saw Jaws. That's that's 
20 years I later. It's crazy. It's crazy, but it's true. That is was filmed in the 70s. That was filmed in like 77. That's now, amazing. Th- thank God he didn't get that carried away with Star Wars. Now, she has little Princess Leia <laughs> yeah, buns. Put some, yeah, he could have put uh, robots into it. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, I thought that was crazy, but it's true. And it's like you can kind of like when you're watching it, pay attention. It looks a little different from the rest of the movie. It's so weird. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? The other thing is they dub this movie in English. There's a few people who come up most episodes of this video podcast. It was not Groucho. Can you guess? Take a guess who dubbed it in English. Someone who comes up a lot. You'll be, you'll love it. You're, I you're don't, love I don't know. You have to tell me. It's Christopher Lee. <laughs> Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee dubbed every word of the English version. I don't know if he did the female voices, but I don't know. That's what they say, every word. So Incredible. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I don't even that's know if that's amazing. true. You know, there's so much said about Christopher Lee. Who knows what's true? But that's what I read in several sources. I don't know. Well, if you I'm... got it from Christopher Lee, there's a chance <laughs> yeah, it might not be true. Right. That's the thing. Christopher Lee used to credit himself with a lot of things. Now, this movie did very, very well. It was nominated for Oscar for screenplay, um, and it sold 5 million tickets in France. He had a little bit of good luck in that there was a major, major strike. The rails weren't running. The rails were not running. And so people couldn't go on their vacations that summer. So they did this instead. That boosted his sales for sure. But it was very critically acclaimed in the whole thing. You know, Cannes, well, the, French you know, really are, the French are known for not being cinephiles. <laughs> yes. They, they traditionally hate movies. <laughs> so it's hard to get them into a theater. That's right. And the next movie was 1958's Mon Oncle, My Uncle, Mon Oncle. That's his first real color film. And it's very colorful and it's great. I yeah. love all of his color. Actually, this won for Oscar Best Foreign Film. This won an Oscar. Do you want to give a little quick synopsis? You meet this child who lives with his parents in this ultra modern home, very much like uh, the beginning of Playtime, this uh, antiseptic, angular uh, home that is full of modern gadgets and, and equipment. And the modern gadgets are so modern that they're kind of absurd. Like their, their kitchen doesn't have a single fixture in it that you recognize from a kitchen. There's nothing that looks like a stove or anything. Uh, it looks more like a dentist's office. Yeah. And then you meet the, you find out that uh, this child's uncle is Hugh Lowe. And Hugh Lowe lives in a different part of town. He lives in the old part of town. It's, a, it's across a, a broken wall, and it basically is the old Paris. It's, the, it's, it's like 19th century Paris. Uh, Hugh Lowe, who lives in this beautiful old 19th century looking house where there are all these different uh, stairways and hallways, and you can see him going from the top to the bottom through all the different passageways. Yeah, it was very influential. A lot of people have used that as a reference, including the Powerpuff Girls, as far as their um, home base. Wes the Anderson, cartoons. sure. Yeah, Wes course, Anderson. Yeah, it's very, because yeah. it's really brilliant. It's a very unique, brilliant. That was a real beautiful Tati invention, was that design of, of Hulot's house. Definitely seems to be the most criticism of, a, of, of the modern world in that movie, I think. Everything in it is completely impractical in the in right. every way. And so, right. for example, if you exit the house and you want to get to something that's like maybe six feet away, you have to follow this very carefully laid out path because everything yeah. in between is like grass and sand that you really can't walk on, especially in your little heels that all these women are in. It takes you like five times longer to get from point A to point B than it would if you just took a straight line, which you can't do because then you're going to kind of sink into the gravel. But from... The entrance to the building to Hulot's apartment at the top, you're also, it's, it's also a maze yeah, that he has yeah, to go through. Yeah, it so is. it's kind of like, he's still not being overly critical. He's basically just saying it's all, it's all, it's all silly and absurd. He presents the parents as very status minded, you know. Yeah. They have this silly fountain that they turn on and off for visitors, but only if the visitors seem to be important. Right. You know? Then they immediately shut it off. If you, if you prove yourself not to be important enough, yeah, they if immediately you're just shut it off. They just her don't brother, care. you just like, eh, yeah. turn it off. And there's all these little funny sight gags around. I love the gag with the two windows that look like eyes that are following him in the yard. The other thing I want to point out that I love, and so there's one little nice aspect of Tati is dogs. He loves dogs, man. He loves, he's really good with dogs. He is a master yeah. of directing dogs. And you'll see them in almost every movie. And in this one, they are like kind of a, a little bit also the heart of the movie. It opens with these dogs and he found them in a shelter. You know, these were not trained actor dogs, just like his people, just like his people. He didn't want trained actor dogs. He wanted real dogs. And they're just running willy nilly all over this town. He, he literally films them peeing. 
because that's how raw he wants it. You know, he wants it raw. Yeah. He wants them just going nuts and winding around in circles and chasing their tails. And it, it's a delight. It's an absolute delight. And the contrast between the dogs and the, and the couple and, and that kind of thing is just wonderful. Um, and the couple owns this one little um, dachshund. It's just the greatest, the absolute greatest dog. I love when, when Hulo goes in for the job interview and the dogs follow him in yeah. to the office. <laughs> and then they have to be ejected from it. Um, there is one big, big significant difference between Mon Uncle and Playtime. And I think we need to mention that, which is in Mon Uncle, there is delicious looking food. Oh, my God. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. The crawlers, man, the crawlers. <laughs> So those kids, all right, so those kids, they they are, so the, again, the contrast is the, this, this young child, Gerard, being in his, his little prison of a home and then bursting into freedom, just like the doggies, out in the wilds of like old part of town. And they yeah, go all over. a day out with his uncle. Yeah. yeah, they go all over the, and so he ends up, you know, and the uncle lets him go play with the kids because the uncle knows. He doesn't really want to just hang out with his uncle. He also wants to play with the kids. And the uncle just goes along and it's like, yeah, go ahead. You go play with your friends. You know, you're in this like empty back lot of hilly wilds of un, just untrammeled area of town. And in the middle of this crappy area of town is this, this vendor who's selling crawlers. And so he, he's just, all he does, that's his entire niche, is selling crawlers to poor kids. You know, like these poor kids who probably like stole the money from their parents. And this guy, he just pours beautiful like strawberry jam and then he sprinkles it with confectioner sugar and you you just, by God, you want one of this. Yeah, I, gotta I want find one right now. Yeah, I, gotta find I do. Crawler. So Monoc, again, as we said, won him an Oscar, won him critical acclaim, but also some not critical acclaim. Each of his movies is, is definitely a progression. You know, they're, they're not completely alike. And this was a lot more arty, it was a lot more abstract, and some people weren't as crazy about it. The audience was a little more mixed than they were with the last two. And one of the people who was critical of it actually was Francois Truffaut. Again, between Mononc and Playtime, there was a lot of time in between, and Francois Truffaut's career was developing during that time as, as the other artists of the French New Wave. And so at some point in between those two movies, Truffaut said, I'll just read you a few quotes. Tati creates a mad, nightmarish, overly concentrated universe which paralyzes laughter rather than engenders it. The ultra-modern kitchen is funny the first time, somewhat less so the second time, not at all the third. He calls his humor extremely restricted. He used the word laborious. And he says his aesthetic position and inane logic lead to a totally deformed and obsessive worldview. So he was very critical. Now, Tati was really upset by that. He mm. actually was really, you know, he had a real respect for the artist, the art art scene, the art scene. And he was a little bit crushed by that. And I believe that was kind of pushed him, what, what kind of pushed him to make Playtime a lot artier. Uh, you know, Playtime's a real art film. It really is. And I think that's part of it was he was striving. He would, he really, what he really wanted. And he said this at film festivals and stuff, ultimately was, you know, with Playtime, he didn't care so much, except for that he wanted the young people to like it. You know, he wanted the arty crowd to like it. But that was kind of interesting. And then ultimately, after Playtime came out, and I think Truffaut knew that he was upset about those past quotes, he personally wrote to Tati, Truffaut did, and said, I, I, that's a masterpiece. And, you know, that's when he said the thing about being from another planet. And he then did uh -huh. nothing but talk about how wonderful Tati was from there on. You know, he, he talked, spoke with that. Great. Adoration. Well, that is wonderful. Do you know yeah. there's a cinema in Paris named after Tati? I did not. Yeah, there is. Um, it's called Le Champo, but it's now called Le Champo Jacques Tati. Oh, very nice. It's a cinema that's been there for 80 years, and at one point, Truffaut referred to it when it was just called Le Champo. Truffaut referred to that cinema as his headquarters. Well, so then Playtime... We, 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 we told you there, so we will now uh, finish up quickly his life with the next film, 1971, was Traffic, Traffic, Traffic. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how Playtime kind of destroyed him. I'm sorry to say, but it kind of destroyed him. It really cost him a lot of his health, cost him completely financially, and his mental health. He was, people said he was never the same after Playtime, and he was actually quite mostly, in, you know, often in depression mode, which he had not been before then. He had a very comfortable, happy life before then. And Playtime kind of took that away from him. And he, he really was moody. He was always a little bit difficult to work with. He was a very demanding director. Not everybody liked working with him. But, you know, he wasn't thought of as a depressive, but he was after yeah. Playtime. Yeah, I think I had read somewhere that his set, his set was not a, uh, a, 
a very funny place to be. <laughs> yeah. Like his movies are funny. The set, mm, not so much. Yeah, he's very demanding. And he got, and, and you know, kind of like how you see Peter Sellers going off the rails. We were talking about that. You know, he kind of went off the rails at this point. He was already difficult. And then he got really difficult. So traffic, you know, one of the things is it took a long time to produce. And he, he went through staff, like, you know, people just quit left and right. Or he got, they got fired left mm -hmm. and right. You know, he went through a lot of staff. So there was a lot of reshoots and all this stuff. And he just did it in chunks. He didn't even really know the whole story as he's going along. And, he, and you know, when you read about the production of Traffic, you think, oh, this is going to be a terrible film because it was just the way it was put together was so sloppy and so disjointed. And there was so much bad vibe all through, all through very bad vibe. But I was pleasantly surprised when I watched it. I thought it was actually quite enjoyable. You like this kinda, movie too. I kind of love Traffic. I really do, yeah. actually. It's like a lot of Tati's films. It's like there's no real story there there's simply a this the group of people are trying to get to this auto show and then they get there you know things go wrong with their vehicle on the way there and by the time they get to this this big auto show with the vehicle that they're there to display the auto show is is over and that's the, that's pretty much it that's the, that's the whole movie as you can imagine they they run out of gas they have car right. accidents they get impounded by the police right, mechanical problems everything you can imagine along the way you know that you would imagine in a kind of a road trip kind of movie happens but it's it's charming movie yeah and i guess hulo is in it as the designer of the he's a designer this, like, he's... like yeah he designed this like sort of like swiss army knife of a vehicle that's like a it's a camper and you can make you can convert it into sort of an rv or something like that you know it does all these things it has this thing you pull out with a stove again it's like this obsession with like the latest modern invention yeah um yeah and sort of satirizing th that that concept of you know the handy gadgets and this has a, one of the most interesting female characters. They, there's this sort of bitch on wheels kind of PR lady, um, and and I know it's really fun. They make you know they make fun of her, but she's it's also you know at the same time with some affection. Again, Tati never dislikes his characters. You know, he he always seems to think that they're all worthwhile people. Again, it's like I wish he had developed the jokes a little bit more. Same thing for me with all the films is. Some of the, you know, like many of the jokes are just way too simple for me, just way too simple. And, and I just wish he had done that Buster Keaton thing where he developed the jokes a little bit more. They were just a couple layers more complex than what he did. But it's a fun, like, again, especially because it's a slice of life in that time of what would be like, you know, in the year, you know, like around 1970, driving around that part of Europe, driving from like um, probably Paris to somewhere in Amsterdam is where this car show was. Uh, you know, you, you see these great little old buildings and, you know, these people who live off the beaten track. And, and you know, it's just, again, this is all yeah, really yeah. fun for us to, to take that in. Very authentic. There's also, you know, great shots of just cars driving on like the, on like streets and freeways. And there's, it's so beautifully edited. There's like some, there's like a scene towards the, the beginning of the film where you're seeing cars go by and the rhythm of the editing, it's cut in time to the music that's playing and it becomes this kind of symphony, you know, and it's really wonderful. I love the color palette in this movie. And yeah, there are some yeah. shots that are spectacular, like some of the shots inside these giant hangar sized buildings. And um, I love the, co the colors of the truck they're driving in and the colors of the camper. And um, again, just a beautiful palette, beautiful stylization. And the costumes, the, the, the bitchy woman is in these great, great outfits. I do love movies where there's a central goal and and they don't meet it yeah and they don't care they're like oh we're, we, it, we thought yeah, we were it yeah does, <laughs> it doesn't care. matter it doesn't only matter. one person is blowing his gasket because he has to pay for it but everybody else is like oh were we two days late oh i didn't realize you know yeah <laughs> kind of I, I love a movie that sets up here's what needs to happen and then it doesn't happen now many consider this the final movie of tati um it, it really is the final feature cinematic feature of Tati there was a lot of offers by the way to do Hulo as a TV series he got offers Tati is quoted as saying why should I put myself between spaghetti and Danish beer he he looked down on TV very much he was a, he was a TV snob for sure he did not well you know who had his own TV series <sighs> Mr. Bean. Well, well, guess who else ended up, you know, agreeing to a TV series was Mr. Tati when he had needed the money, by God, he needed that money. So Swedish television offered him a 13-episode series for him to kind of do whatever he wanted. 
And so, of course, he got really ambitious. He got Igmar Bergman's cinematographer, Gunnar Fischer, you know, just like one of the world's greatest cinematographers. He was slated to do 13 short films for television, 13 short films. Now, at this point, he's really unhealthy. He's, he's getting cancer. He, he's had some cancer scares, and he's, he's, he's just weakened in general. And he has, and during this time, he has a mini stroke and that kind of thing. He was very depleted and very mentally unhealthy. So when he was putting these short films together, he got obsessive and crazy and kept upping the stakes and upping the stakes. And they were like, we can't afford this. There was no kind of reining him in, and it was just very difficult. So in the end, they ended up putting together one long film, which was really for television. It included video. It included several kinds of film because he couldn't, you know, they, he kept switching uh, media. It was kind of a big mess. But because they had this wonderful cinematographer and because they kind of pulled it all together, they came out with Parade. And... Parade. Okay, Parade is kind of a, it's not really a movie. Again, it's a television film of a circus act. And it really is just a, you have an audience sitting in a circus. You see this whole audience. A lot, some of them are actors, some of them are just real people watching. You have jugglers, you have an orchestra, you have a comedy. It's a comedy orchestra. You've, you know, fun singers, you have acrobatic kind of people. But the, the best thing about this is, you have Tati in his 60s doing the stuff that was never really completely caught on film when he was a young man. That stuff he was doing yeah, in the wow. cabarets and in the circuses, he does in parade. So that's why you need to watch it, is don't watch the whole thing. I'm, I'm going to tell you not to watch the whole thing, but go skip through and watch Tati because he's still quite good at being the soccer goalie, at being the tennis player. It's quite... It's quite lovely, and it's wow. Yeah, there it is. It's all there, and also you you got to watch the jugglers too. They start off slow, and you're like, eh. We'll keep watching the jugglers. They're amazing. The jugglers are amazing. So watch the jugglers. Okay. The only other thing to know about that is it was filmed in a few places, um, but you know it started out in the studio, the Swedish studio. So a lot of it was filmed. Some of it was filmed in this actual circus performance space, but some of it was filmed in a Swedish studio. And the thing that followed it that was filmed was another disaster kind of an expensive disaster Swedish studio Joe do you want to take a guess what was filmed yes. in the studio <laughs> I will guess it might have something to do with somebody who I've already mentioned Monsieur Jerry Lewis and it Indeed. was his uh his epic the day the clown cried which yeah. I am I I'm looking at the calendar every month to see how close we are to the the uh, period of time after Jerry's death that we're going to be allowed to see that film. Two years, and two I'm, years. I'm telling you, it's two, it's two years away now. Oh, that two years, that can't come soon enough. That cannot come soon Just enough. Just so people, for people who don't know, The Day the Clown Cry, it is a famously lost, you know, it's, it's a film that Jerry Lewis did um, that he never wanted anybody to see. And he, he did give it to the Library of Congress with the agreement that they wouldn't show it until 2024. We're not that far. We're not yeah, that far away, and it can't and it can't come soon enough. Um, <laughs> so parts, a Jerry of, Lewis, parts of it were yeah, from there. There's a Jerry Lewis movie that I thought of a few times while I was watching Playtime again, and it's the last movie he ever directed, and it was called Cracking Up, and I actually kind of like it. It's not by any standards a good movie, in the traditional sense. But it has a lot of these gags that are very similar to Hugh Lowe in The Waiting Room, where there's, there's no sound but the sort of hum of The Waiting Room. And the joke is he sits down and the, and the chair makes a big noise. I know Lewis was influenced by, by Tati, and there's a lot of that in, in his last movie, Cracking Up. There's a scene where he goes into a psychiatrist's office and the, and the floor has been waxed and it's so slippery that he can't, he can't stand up. And it's, he had that same you know, physical skill that Tati had where he could like appear to be slipping around on the floor, but be in total control about, about it. And, uh, I don't know if you're in the right mood and you're, you you feel the right way. Jerry Lewis's last film cracking up. Yeah. It's got something. It's got something I like. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. All right. All right. There's your homework assignment. That's your homework assignment. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, so, so that was his last one. Now, there's two things we need to just quickly, quickly, quickly mention. In 1956, uh, he wrote a script called The Illusionist, right before Mononc. And um, that was a, a, about a man who takes under his wing a young lady. And it was, it was eventually, in 2010, made into an animated film 
by the great Sylvain Chomet, who did the triplets of Belleville. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's gorgeous. And he, he what he did was um, made Tati at the star, the, 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 the central figure, you know, just was really just Tati, or maybe a little bit Hula. The character in the animated film is made to look pretty much exactly like Tati, yeah. as if he had filmed another movie, basically. Yeah, it was nominated for an Academy Award. It, it, you know, it really deserved it, for sure. Now, what's yeah. interesting is um, his daughter Sophie thought it was about her, and she was the one who suggest, kind of suggested to Chomei to do this, uh, you know, in a roundabout way. But the going back to his earlier life, he had that, um, I don't want to say illegitimate daughter, because that's just illegitimate people of the world unite. Guy hey. <laughs> Look who you're that's, talking to. It's just that every time I'd see this written, it'd say his illegitimate child. And I just, that's a terrible, really bad, I'm just like, stop using that term. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I've been legitimized. <laughs> Let's just say that. All right. So the I daughter, have been legitimized. the daughter he had, that earliest daughter, the eldest daughter who he had abandoned, came forward. And actually, the 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 second daughter died before this film came out. Before the film came out, so that the older daughter who was still alive said, "You know what? That's about me. That film's about me, and it's about his guilt about abandoning me." Now, she claims that at one point in Morocco, there were bad things happening. I don't remember what time period this was. And she wrote to Tati and said, please let me um, have passage to Paris to be with, to at least just get to Paris to get out of here because my friends are getting killed. And he didn't do it. He refused to do it. So I don't mm. know. That's what she says. And so, I, you know, that's what her, her son says. She claimed that, and she claimed that she felt this was really about her and about his guilt for not, like, t taking care of her or giving her safe passage. So it's very controversial. It's gorgeous, though. It's beautiful. It's yeah. touching. It's well, I knew the director was a big fan because in the in his earlier film, The uh, Triplets of Belleville, there's a scene where the character's watching television, and instead of the image on the television screen being animated, they just put actual footage from uh, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. Right, that's what, or I think screen. it was, Jure yeah. was it might have been Jure de Fet. And then the only other thing is there's a script called Confusion, Confusion. That was something he wrote later in life, towards the end, and it is a fully written script. Tashin, you know, Tashin puts together these amazing, It's a, there's a five volume set on Tati, and both of those scripts, his original illusionist script and the Confusion script are in there. They're completed scripts. You can read them. Go to your local public library, look at those Tashin books. Um, but that was a film that was never made, and he was collaborating, weirdly enough, with the Sparks, with Sp the band Sparks. They're not the Sparks, they're just Sparks. They were collaborating. They did uh, actually write a song about uh, that was supposed to be in the movie. I have a feeling it never got close, not never got close to being made. Confusion, no pardon the intrusion. This must not be the rumor was in the other night. He died um, uh, of, from being a very heavy smoker. He, yeah, pulmonary embolism, but also, yeah, he can't. He for sure had cancer. That you know, he had been diagnosed with pretty serious cancer. It, so it was a you know, it was a combination of things. Eight, 1982, and um, that's the life of Jacques Tati. All right, let's get back to playtime. What I really wanted to talk about in the second half was the dance, the royal garden scene. So that's 45 yeah, yeah. minutes of this movie. 45 right, minutes. Yeah. Now he was talked down. He was talked down. There were 40 scripted shots cut. Before they were, you know, he cut the scripted shots like they weren't filmed, but people had to convince him of that. He had to be talked out of 40 shots. Wow. Yeah. And there's and so of course, much going on. There's in this so much. You sequence. can't believe it. I mean, this is 45 yeah. minutes long and there was so much more. There was it's, so much. It's more. almost in real time. It's almost an yeah. evening out in, in real, real time. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it took seven weeks to rehearse and shoot that, that entire you know segment. And the rehearsal was huge because. You had many layers of people, so he would rehearse the people in the back first, then he'd rehearse the middle ground, then he'd rehearse yeah, the yeah. foreground people, and then he'd have them all running at the same time. It was very choreographed to perfection. Now, these people are terrible dancers, by the way. Terrible dancers. I thought that was really funny. Oh, yeah. They're not. They're just kind of like, uh, uh, uh. They're and, horrible. And, and some of them the are kind of dancing a oh, little, there's... and and there's one woman who's just like gyrating like a Anne margaret go-go dancer. Yeah. Like she's completely, you know, over the top. There's like one couple who are good at dancing and everybody else is not just mediocre. They're terrible. And I think yeah, that's a great, like, mm. I think that's, it's sort of like the food. All the food is disgusting and all the people don't know how to dance, but they're having a ball. So that's fine. They're having, a, they're having ball. a ball. Well, I mentioned earlier, because we were talking about the set, I mentioned Popeye, but there's the, 
sort of coordinated chaos going on in this nightclub. That also reminds me of Altman's Popeye because of the way Altman filled the background with Bill Irwin and all these people who were like acrobats and mimes and had them all doing stuff. And, you know, in like crowd scenes, they're all doing stuff. One guy is chasing his hat around and another guy is is trying to sneak out the back. There's all these physical things going on and you notice them little by little. Uh, and that's sort of what's going on in this nightclub. And you have to watch it a number of times to catch all the stuff that's going on. And this and and there's still things I'm catching. Like I just realized the last time I watched it that there's a scene where a guy angrily sends back the chicken saying it's cold. Like, I, I send this back, it's cold. And I realized that earlier they had set up that all the hot food was gone. They only they only had cold chicken to serve. Yeah. So it's intentionally cold food, but the guy is sending back the cold food. Yeah, yeah. Because he doesn't know it's supposed to be cold. And there's the, there's all these little, little gags. I love the waiter who ends up wearing entirely dressed in rags by the end of the night because people keep trading clothes with him he's ripped his pants but then somebody else rips their jacket so they trade with him and then somebody else gets their tie ruined and so they trade ties with him and by the end of it everything he's wearing is just rags yeah. and he and he's stuck standing outside the restaurant and this is where um hulo breaks the door i only just noticed on my last viewing that when they scoop up all that glass they put it into sort of a they put container they, they put it in the ice bucket they put yeah. it in the ice bucket but so so really just to set this up is this restaurant nightclub the architects were literally still there minutes before they opened putting on the final right. touches they were right. just really late with putting the final touches on this restaurant so you see them just like clearing away all the carpentry and as quickly as they can as people are just walking in in their little mink stalls you know in their little parisian black outfits with white pearls kind of stuff very dressed up it's a you know it's a real nice nightclub it's called the royal garden on purpose it's an english english name on purpose, you know, and, and one of the prominent guests is an American, you know, he's supposed to be the classic obnoxious American. Now, of course, because it's Tati, by the end of it, you love him, you know, you love, you love him, him completely. Yeah, yeah. So, so because this was just completed, it starts falling apart immediately. Like the right. first thing is right. like a tile comes up. And the next thing is some lights in the steps that are supposed to light the steps don't work. Just little things. You notice that yeah, they, the they did a very a bad problem. job designing this. Yeah, the chairs, the chairs have fresh paint on them and they leave a a crown on people's backs yeah, imprint yeah there's just uh, you know it's just like every little element of design is terrible it's all sparkle and no substance like there's nothing yeah. holding yeah. it together but scotch tape basically is kind of what's going on here so it just literally falls apart and it's it is done in silent movie kind of style where by the end of it, I mean, it's just, you know, a disaster. Like, you know, really, in real life, they would have evacuated all those people because at some point there's like smoke everywhere. I mean, you know, there would have been a fire. I mean, it was it was like a, people could have been killed very easily. But well, that's, there is, that's there's, kind of... there's a thing with like sparks and everything. Yeah, just yeah going, no, it's yeah, very, there's... no, they would have evacuated I noticed them. that. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and so the, and the band leaves and then there's this great moment where the, the American businessman says, well, we need some music in here. And he gets lovely Barbara to come yes. and play the piano and then this French woman starts singing with her and oh it's just it's just gorgeous. Any other favorite gags? Oh, I mean there's so much there's so much going on in the nightclub. They keep throwing this one drunk out. The neon sign has an arrow and so as soon as he he leaves he sees the neon sign that directs him right back in. And then of course uh, there's a the architect is so bad that there's a column right by right in front of the entrance. And Hulo bumps his head on it, and the bouncer immediately thinks he's a drunk and throws him out. The one waiter, you, you notice that the waiter was holding, he's holding just the back of a chair in his hand. And there's a woman who sees the back of the chair and, and thinks she, he's holding a chair out for her, so she sits down and falls to the floor. Oh, I didn't even notice that one. You yeah, know what I noticed? Yeah. I, I noticed for the first time there's a woman who is in a long, fancy dress, and she floats. Did you notice her? She floats. She is no, clearly I didn't notice being, her. She's clearly being dragged on wheels. To me, it's a weird, it doesn't land well. I think it's just bizarre. But it's a weird detail that I didn't notice till you know, this, I watched it, like, notice. watched this three times in preparation for the show. And only the third time I was like, what is it with that lady who's floating by? There's some very odd little jokes that I don't think always work. It's very subtle stuff, and he throws in the kitchen sink. But, you know, none of them are, like, div this is my problem, the only problem, you know. And I think, again, this is a masterpiece. There's no denying this is a masterpiece movie. 
This yeah, is a movie yeah. you have to experience. It will change you a little bit. You know what I mean? It'll change your brain a little bit. In 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 you know again for like 24 hours you're going to be sort of thinking and the, the way this movie rewires you a little bit. But you know I think he, it's surprising that he didn't go further with a lot of these jokes in a Buster Keaton kind of way. I think it's surprising that he didn't take some of these to a slightly different level, that they're so incredibly simple. Yeah. And in fact, like one example is when they have, he goes visits a friend who lives in, an, in a building that is- The apartment is, complex. The apartment yeah, the apartment uh, uh, scene, yeah. Each apartment is a, a complete plate glass window. So it's as if each apartment is a fish tank and you see everything that's going on it's as if it's a yeah. shop window, a shop window. It looks, you, it looks like shop windows, right. Yeah, and you don't hear any of their conversation. You're just watching. You're like the person on the street looking in, and that's it. You don't hear any of the conversation. And at one point, they're all kind of watching the same TV, like back-to-back -back, You know, in the apartments. They're sort of all staring in the same yeah. direction at the TV that's in the wall. And they're watching like boxing, it looks like. And there's some subtle jokes that he does there. But I just feel like... They're not, first of all, obvious enough. And secondly, there's just so much more he could have done to make that so much more funny and visually satisfying. As visually satisfying as it is, the jokes are just a little too subtle there. To me, that was just such an opportunity. I don't know. Just, I don't know. To me, it's, it's a little, there's a little oddness there. And I think it's just Tati had such a gentle sense of humor. You know, he just, that was who he was. And it is the flavor of the movie. And again, this is just all of his stuff. You know, you can watch it with kids. You should watch it as you're sipping, you know, a mimosa and, you know, you're like, uh, I don't know, soaking your feet. In wine. <laughs> you're sipping wine, Susan. It's French. You're sipping wine. Well, it's mimosa. And eating champagne. cheese. You're eating brie. You're eating brie for sure. You're definitely eating brie. Um, eating, oh, I'm eating brie now. Yeah. After the um, the disaster at Royal Gardens, which would should refer to Arena as the, it, they should, you know, one of those disaster YouTube channels should yeah. should do a parody cover of the disaster at Royal Gardens. And we, should, we should mention this is their opening. This is the opening night of the nightclub and everything goes wrong. And you see one woman walking out saying it's the same thing every night. <laughs> I didn't notice that. I actually did not yeah. notice that. That's yeah. brilliant. That's brilliant. But they all end up in a drugstore. The American, the obnoxious American buys them all drinks and coffee and stuff. The sun is rising on Tativille, which is so beautiful. You know, night is filmed at night and sunrise was filmed at, at uh, dawn. And you can see the way the light comes up over these fake buildings. It's so beautiful. It's really lovely. And that's where music starts playing again on the soundtrack. Yeah, they end up in this dr in the drugstore from the night before, which looked terrible the night before. It was all lit in sickly green, and now it looks like a really fun place. It looks actually really, really nice for breakfast. Yeah, it's very warm. Yeah, it's kind of fun. You want to be there for sure. That's the best part. Like, you definitely want to be there for that. Yeah, especially with all your friends who you were out clubbing with all night. You know, yeah. all your new friends you didn't even know, and they're and they're all there. And Barbara is there, and and Hulo is there, and the American is there buying everyone their breakfast. What I noticed is this cold antiseptic city now looks different in the morning because now there are splashes of color everywhere. There are flags mm -hmm. flying. Yeah. And there are more colorful signs. People are dressed a little more colorfully and the music is playing on the soundtrack. You see the cars going around the roundabout and the cars are colorful and the the center of the roundabout has a little sort of a like a stripy pattern on it and you realize oh it's a carousel it's a it's yeah. a it's a merry-go-round is what it is it, it hits it very hard it hits it, it, yeah. hits it very yeah. hard it's yeah. an absolute you literally have right. someone riding by on a motorcycle going like up and down as if she's on you know you have stuff like that and then at one point um there's a guy washing the windows and you see the reflection of the, all the americans in the tour bus and then as he bends the window right. to when he reach moves the, top the window, of it, it's as it's if like they're, on a, they're ride. on a ride going yeah. up and down. So and they go, he hits it super Ooh. hard. The music yeah. is carousel music. The whole thing couldn't be hit harder. And you are just, and you are just, nobody's going anywhere. They're just going in a circle and going in a circle and going in a circle. The city is a playground is what he's saying. Yeah. The city can be, be a playground. And what makes it a playground is the people in it and their spirit and their joy. And I think that's, that's why it ends on such a, positive note and this just you know just doubles down on what we we're just saying he wanted to end the movie where everybody ends up back at the airport and what happens in the theater and there's just no way to do this is he wanted there to be shadows in the theater of the characters in the movie barbara and the american tourist ladies and whoever else whatever the guests at the royal gardens shadows silhouettes shadows along the theater walls exiting with 
the audience exiting. He wanted that somehow to happen. Now, you hmm. know, obviously that was extremely impractical, but it would have been amazing. And that just shows you what he was going for. You know, that really, the, the humanity of it. You know, he wanted you it's, to be hanging out yeah, with these characters. Absolutely. You know? It's about that. Yeah. There's movies this reminds me of, like, um, like Slacker, like uh, Richard Linklater's Slacker. It yeah. reminds me of, in that it's not a movie with a story. It's a movie that you spend time in. You know, it's a movie to right. hang out. You just out wander, with. wander among the characters and take in little moments. Yeah, yeah. and it just and it just I flows that like that. There's no, yeah, and I love I love Slacker too. I mean, I haven't um, seen it since it came out. I saw it yeah. when it came out. It was amazing when you saw it. You were like, wow, that's. Check it out again. It's it's interesting it to revisit up. that after yeah, thirty I, years. I it's very it. interesting to revisit that after thirty years and see because you know you where you were thirty years ago is different from where you are now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of that. It's kind of just a movie where you just like wander through it. There's no particular story. So the other movie I this it reminds me of, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to think of this, is is Brazil, is Gilliam's Brazil. Um, and I've mentioned that before, but it starts out having something in common with Brazil, which is it shows uh, the mechanisms of the city and society uh, as being overwhelming. But where Brazil shows those mechanisms crushing the human spirit, this movie shows the human spirit shining through them, you know, and it, and it, and it shows that whatever happens, the, the, the infrastructure of society is going to break down anyway. You know, the ceiling is going to fall down in the nightclub, the door is going to break, but people will improvise, you know, they'll improvise a little door out of the, out of the doorknob and we'll find a way to live in harmony and thrive. And the mechanisms of society are not going to crush the human spirit. It's always going to shine through, through, through the steel is the point of this movie. And, you know, that's what I, that's what I get from it. And I love it. Well, you know, again, I, I, you know, for me, it's Metropolis is the obvious connection here, um, where it's just really a analysis of, of modernism. You know, Metropolis actually ends with everything falling apart. Same thing, you know, everything falls yeah, apart. Yeah. And also in Metropolis, you have people walking in straight lines and the whole thing. You know, I can't help feeling like, you know, he loved, obviously he loved silent movies, that Metropolis was huge, huge for him. And I hate to be so pretentious in my assessment of the film, but I mean, we're French this week, right? Uh, yeah, I should be a little vrai, pretentious. C'est vrai, c'est vrai. Uh -huh. the... <laughs> now, I'll just give you a couple of closing remarks from Tati himself. Uh, he said, I'm proud of Playtime. It's exactly the picture I wanted to make. I've suffered a lot because of it, physically and financially, but it's really the film I wanted to do. Now, again, he went completely bankrupt. He had to mortgage his house. He lost all the film rights to all his past films. They had to auction them off. He borrowed money from everybody he could knew or didn't know or five degrees away from him and anybody and everybody. His sister was older than him. She lost her retirement. They lost the family fortune. Nobody had any money after this. He had a beautiful house. He ended up living in an apartment, I'm pretty sure. And um, it was a disaster. I mean, his sister didn't have money for the rest of her life. I mean, it's really quite sad. So here's another Tati quote. This was shortly after Playtime, before he did anything else. Before he did Traffic, I'm fed up playing Don Quixote. I've ruined my health on this adventure, and I've really got everybody against me after Playtime. I would really like to stop. That's how exhausted he was at the end of it. A lot of people were very mad at him and et cetera, but he did get a couple more, you know, a couple of things out that were worth it, you know, that I'm glad he did. So it's, it's a bittersweet kind of thing, but you know, it's a masterpiece. There's nothing like it. And it's an experience. There's nothing like it. Yeah. There's it's nothing an like it. It's an yeah. experience. It's an experience. So we are, I think we're done. We've, we've, we've done Tati. All right. So um, we end this program with a catchphrase and the catchphrase is me saying comedy is tragedy plus and then i say something and then it was in honor of tati and the beautiful simplicity of what he did i'm going to use a nice simple one but a classic comedy is tragedy plus pratfalls what do you think of pratfalls joe i like them better than regular falls i think that the, the <laughs> prat is the is the part that makes them funny when what you is, add the prat they become funny what is the prat what is the prat exactly what is the prat i don't know i don't do, do you know what the prat I is i don't know i know so the definition is to fall in one's buttocks. So you have to specifically. Well, that's the Pratt. Well, that's got to be the Pratt, is right? Pratt, is Pratt that's a word? Pr you fall right on your Pratt. One of, one of the definitions of Pratt is a person's buttocks. I knew it. I knew it. 
So of course, yeah, there why you would go. I? Why, yeah. So we're so if you're watching the video version, you you're watching a bunch of pratfalls that I edited into this because you know yeah. they really are very. They can be you know as simple as they are. There, there's no getting around it. They're funny. They're they can be very funny. That's true. Well, I would simply like to end by saying, uh, comedy equals tragedy. Plus. Mais oui, mais oui. Le pipe et le père Pouloui. Le père Pouloui. Si n'est pas un pipe. Uh, uh, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. Monsieur Magritte. All right. Thanks for watching our Tati Spectacular. We'll see you next time.